with not only people who join this webinar. Okay. Hi, I'm Nerius and one of the uh, facilitators of uh, a massive open online course uh, about Erasmus Plus funding opportunities for you. And we are today hosting a second webinar in a series of uh, webinars focused on quality. And this, uh, these months we dedicated for uh, quality in youth exchanges. Uh, today we'll be uh, listening and sharing uh, good practices from using tools, methods, activities in youth exchange projects. So how do you select what kind of tools, what are good practices? Uh, we have uh, two guest uh, contributors for uh, this webinar. Uh, Buz Buri, who is an educator and creative uh, with a professional background in working with young people and as a trainer in non-formal education field. Uh, he has a lot of experience working with youth participation, especially in the arts, and now is one of the trainers for a training course, a residential training course, Tools for Youth Exchanges. Uh, right now, there is also a call for this training if uh, uh, conditions will allow in autumn to have a real uh, training activity focused on Tools for Youth Exchanges. And uh, Bus has experience of supporting and promoting youth exchanges in past years. Uh, and another guest contributor, we have Audrey Rayleigh. She's a program uh, support and development team member in Irish National Agency for Erasmus Lergas uh, National Agency. And her primary role is to provide uh, project support for youth exchanges as part of the Erasmus Plus Youth in Action program. And she has also experience as a youth worker in arts uh, facil facilitation. So we are happy. Uh, we have already more than 50 people joining this webinar and hopefully more people joining it live on Facebook. So wherever you have questions, please use chat uh, functionality to post it and we'll pick it up uh, uh, throughout the conversations. We, we will keep the structure where our contributors will share uh, their good practices and experiences. Then we'll have a session of questions and answers and then we'll continue to the next contributor. So that's the structure for today. And I would like to invite Bus to start with sharing about tools for youth exchanges. I will uh, share the screen for you and navigate through uh, visual aid. Thank you, Nereus, and welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, crikey, I have three screens to shoot through to see everybody, but uh, that's nice. And uh, I, I see one or two familiar names, so that's quite interesting as well. That's good. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go and talk through the timeline process of um, the timeline process of a youth exchange from the very beginning through to the end. Yeah, and maybe they don't end. Maybe they restart, and these kind of things as well, which we'll explore as well as we go through. So, um, as we say, I'll just call, go through the process. Um, from the very beginning, starting from now, from June, and, uh, and then going right through for a year, including the deadline in October, 1st of October. Okay, so, um, there we go. So, thanks Nerius for sharing the screen. So, the very, we start at the very beginning, as always, and uh, there's one thing that's common that we find ourselves saying a lot in training, in um, in these online meetings and regularly throughout when working with young people is that a youth exchange is more than just a holiday or maybe even is not a holiday <laughs> so sometimes the uh, depending on the type of young people you're working with it's about being clear about what they are they're learning opportunities mobilities for young people to meet with other young people uh, all over um, Europe and beyond so the first thing is like do you do you have a group of young people in mind are you part of the group as a young person? And uh, what do you already know about youth exchanges? And this is what we call the forming process. And here there's lots of exploration and everything else. And maybe you've already visited YouTube and had a look and done a search on Erasmus Plus youth exchange videos, found some examples. And, uh, and also you've um, maybe found out or have an idea of an interest already an area of interest and then we would go into the ideas and inspiration why a youth exchange what's the difference between a youth exchange and actually going on a holiday maybe that's a good area to start um, and there you'd have meetups ideas storming sessions 
exploring themes and topics. And uh, one of the tools and methods that I like to use as well is really getting young people to bring uh, articles from newspapers and magazines or online um, magazines as well. And just think, what are, they, what are their interests? What are they feeling passionate about at the moment? And uh, where do they want to go with things? Um, and then already you've started identifying what are the possibilities for youth exchange. Um, then we start building the group and preparing them for a youth exchange. And in the past, I've, I have learned from experience in doing this in the past 20, 20 odd years of working with young people, because to start a process of applying for funding to realize a youth exchange, it's a big adventure. But then also what happens if you fail, if um, are they prepared for failure, dealing with those expectations and realities and the timescales of how long pe young people have to wait. So here there's lots of trust building and games and building a, building the group, building the activities, building their identity, building their expectations, but also their realities, and also identifying those topics, yeah? And I think it's always really good to check in with young people, a group of young people, find out what would be success, what would success and failure feel like for them if this project was to be realized or not. So it's already started talking about it and thinking about it. Um, the next part of the phase would be, um, confirming young people's ideas and confirming the ideas and their interest for the youth exchange. What is it they really want to know? Is it, is it, I'll, I can give some real examples of young people I've been supporting and working with just recently. One was about living skills for young people who are disadvantaged around homelessness. Another one last year, two couple of years ago was around um, young women and their portrayal in social media. Um, and one before that was about music, the art of music and using music as a learning opportunity. And so there's all those kind of things that start to come out based upon their interests. What are they interested in? Is it a group who are interested, like Neri was saying, uh, a group of young people wants to set up a radio station online for the community or something like that. So you really start to find out what the differences are with the group and what their interests are. And you use a lot of polls, surveys, a thing called Dotmocracy. If you don't know what that is, I recommend you have a look. It's just simple, practical ways of finding out, engaging what their interests of the young people are and confirming their ideas. Um, the next part would be uh, finding partners. Maybe you're already, you respond, you as a group, you've got a group already and they're responding to a partner request. Um, but this is all about online collaboration, getting to know the different people internationally. And maybe a call out for partners, maybe you want to make something on Canva, a poster, make something uh, attractive for partners to see. There's enough online processes that you can use and facilities you can use for uh, sharing and creating a few posters that very clearly talk about the topic, the type of group you are looking for, maybe when you are looking for the exchange to take place, how big is the group, um, and a little bit of a description of the type of group that you would be as well. And then we would go into um, confirming the project partners and starting the process of getting to know your group, getting to know another group, or maybe two or three groups, because uh, maybe it's more than a bilateral exchange, it's, there could be three or four groups involved. So this is about getting to know each other online, starting that process, asking some questions, uh, and confirming, starting to confirm and tease out from the group, what are the aims and objectives? So if three or four groups of young people come together and their interest is about in climate change, how do you then start teasing out what part of climate change do they want to start looking at? What part do they want to explore? And this has to come from the young people. It's, this is from the very beginning, all the ideas and the interest really has, has to come from the young people and they guide, should be guiding leaders and facilitators through that process of completing the ideas and the concepts. Um, and then you really start to confirm down what project is, how many young people, what topic, what methods, where it will take place, and who potentially, which organization will be the lead applicant for the application. Of course, um, the, uh, the next deadline for us in reality is the 1st of October. 
um, 12 o'clock Central Euro European time. So that's the date you'd probably be working to now within this framework, uh, the present framework, and working towards that deadline. So making sure all the partners, all the administrative side of the application needs to be filled in. And one of the things I've, I regularly do is visit the application form and then also look to simplify it. I mean, um, or even asking young people what, they do, what do they understand by that question and finding out and really getting them involved throughout the whole process um, and how they build that and contribute that. And maybe that happens separately within the three or four groups that are involved. And then you come back together and share that um, with each other in the process of writing and submitting an application. So then the 1st of October happens, and this is a crucial part with a lot of groups and certainly uh, one of the youth exchanges I was supporting a couple of years ago um, was a really important part because the application has been submitted, but then you have to maintain the relationship with the young people, keep them motivated and interest maybe, <laughs> um, and maybe keep them connected as well with the international group. Maybe it's through a Facebook group, maybe it's through a WhatsApp group, um, but how do you maintain that communication with each other throughout the long, the, the, the length and the process of the waiting game, waiting for the national agency to confirm with the lead applicant whether the project is approved or not. Um, and maybe there is a lot of the process about getting to know each other has already started to happen before the application. Now it's the application, so you can start going to a, a different level of getting to know each other, yeah? And maybe even planning and thinking what it could be like to be actually on the exchange and what starting exploring a bit deeper about expectations. But it's a, a really important part, the maintaining the relationship with young people. Um, uh, from my, from my uh, experience, it's uh, a hugely valuable part. And that's in the two or three months waiting for the uh, decision from the national agency. So that's continues for the next two or three months. And there is, we can move through to the next slide. The next page, yeah. So then, um, usually two, or th two months, two and a half months, three months, um, you would get the result, depending on the national agency. You get the result, and then you'd start looking at um, uh, getting the result from the partners. Yeah. So sharing the result with the partners, you'd be, um, and um, one of the things I mentioned there. It's like, if you've got it approved, then maybe have a little bit of a celebration party. I also mentioned possibly having a little bit of a celebration party at submitting and meeting the deadline, which is also can be a bit stressful as well. So um, making sure that you celebrate and share that with the uh, rest of the groups that your project has been approved, then for the lead application group, it would be the process of signing the contract and an agreement with the national agency. I'm starting to feel seasick nervous with the, the page moving around, but it's okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so after that, then we'll be moving into the excitement phase, managing that excitement with the group. Yes, the exchange is going to happen, but actually there's still a lot of work to do. Start revisiting the timetable that you've already submitted as part of the application, making sure the aims and objectives are okay making sure that all the participants originally that were involved are still willing to take part and participate and everything else is still in place. Um, so this is a real time to start checking in and making sure the original application, uh, everything you submitted as part of the original application is still valid, relevant and uh, possible as well within the, within the, for all the groups. And this would be a, a real chance to start planning to start dividing tasks, maybe. Um, so you, you've actually, sorry, something keeps popping up on my window. <laughs> so um, you've divided all the tasks, maybe for the process of the week of the application for the actual youth exchange. And you, what you're doing there now is really starting to probably get them to collaborate already in the, within the international groups, different 
individuals coming together, forming different groups to plan and deliver parts of the youth exchange. Yeah, what it is they're going to be delivering, how they're going to deliver it, planning the games, planning all that preparation time. And that's really uh, a lot of online meetings, making sure everything's in place, what they're going to need to take, what they need to bring. Yeah. Um, all those kind. What do they, what are the, some individuals might have already dietary needs as well need to be started taking into consideration for the plan list planning. And this is where it really becomes important to do. I love a checklist and maybe you have two or three checklists throughout the time to be able to prepare for it. Yeah. So checking in with the expectations, the contributions, and then it's almost time to travel and arrive, but that's only for two or three groups. Maybe for one group, it's the hosting and they're in, that they're already planning and delivering that, all the responsibilities that come from hosting the youth exchange as well. And then we just do it, yeah. Lots of non-formal methods, intercultural, it's a, it's a youth work exchange, yeah. There's so lots of young people experiencing different types of, exploring the topic, exploring the aims and objectives through lots of non-formal methods, group work activities, and actually living and sharing together for that week. I'm saying a week, however long it is. <laughs> Um, but one of the things quite often some people can forget to do is also document that week. And that's really important again, is, is how do we document it? I always like to divide tasks, um, divide the tasks in the sense of like small groups dealing with social media, small groups dealing with photographs, videos, uh, small groups dealing with some written outcomes at the end of each day. And then you're already documenting the whole event about what's happening. Yeah, what, thinking about timetables, programs, and thinking about how we're gonna share that with the, already thinking about how we're gonna share that with the wider world. And in the application form, you would have already done, um, how will you disseminate that? You would have answered that question, how you were gonna disseminate the outcomes and the results. And that's really important again, to think about all the documentation that you've got, how you're gonna share that with other groups. Because at the end of the, or even throughout, as well as at the end of the youth exchange, there's a need for sharing the outcomes and the results and the impact that it's had uh, with as many people as possible. And that's from a local and national, international level. Maybe it's with the community where the young people are coming from. Maybe it's with their peers from the youth club or the youth project, or maybe it's with their family and friends. And then maybe also media, newspaper, um, radio and a variety of other platforms, social media online through Facebook and everything else, where they're going to celebrate and share those results. And whilst it says April, May, we accept that sometimes this timeline for the final reporting may be a bit longer, but also um, what can happen sometimes with new people is that uh, the lead applicant is left with the final report, but it's a still a shared responsibility for the whole group for all the partners to be involved in writing that final report and that's all the young people as well it's not something that yeah we had a great exchange we went on that project and then it's all over you're back home you've done your washing and you've almost forgotten about the experience <laughs> no it's um, there's lots of work still to do and that's all about contributing to the final report um, and that's all the partners youth workers young people as well as everything else um, and at the end of that then there's the balance because within an application, getting it approved, you would only get a percentage first. And then upon a successful and agreed final report, you would get the rest of the balance. So maybe there's a few balances that you need to just resolve through the finance, managing the money. And then of course, you might want to sit down with the young people. I think, do we want to do another one? Do we want to host somebody this time? Do we want to have a different topic, a different theme? Or maybe it's a new group within the youth project and it's a whole new process that starts again for you as a youth leader and a youth worker. That's a whistle stop tour, I think. I have no idea how long that's taken. Well, uh, Bruce, you were just in time for uh, uh, having 15 minutes, what we talked about uh, for your contribution. And meanwhile, I would like to invite other people to post your questions to the 
uh, chats on Facebook or on uh, 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 Zoom meeting. I have a question to you. Uh, this all over a long timeline uh, actually is example of a youth exchange uh, which is more than a holiday. But what do you mean by this more than a holiday? For me? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's quite... It's quite interesting. Um, I think when the question I always take it back to is like, why is a youth club important? Yeah. So in the sense of like, uh, if you don't need a youth club and you just want to hang around on the street, then maybe trying to connect it to what the youth project is about and what the youth organization is about. Yeah. So it's, it's not just a place to go and celebrate, have a few parties and everything else, unless you're doing a youth exchange around club culture. <laughs> and you're interested in music and maybe that's the kind of process that you're looking at about intercultural music and that kind of process so i think there is elements that may feel like holiday of course it's going to be fun but it's a making sure it's a learning experience so what are the young people's learning expectations yeah and making sure that it's not just uh, arriving and people do their own thing it's a whole group experience when they're there together i think does that answer your question Nerius? kind of thing I think it elaborates well on uh, why we focus on timeline, uh, stressing a lot uh, about uh, the huge potential for learning opportunities uh, beyond just when we, the groups meet. So, for example, young people learning how to elaborate their ideas to the level that they can apply uh, for a project funding. So once you do it once, uh, together with guidance of youth worker, maybe next time you, young people would be more independent in doing and achieving this step. So uh, seeing how many opportunities young people can have uh, to learn even before the project, uh, actual project starts, it's uh, what we uh, would say impressive in a way and uh, yeah. often not, for, not, not to be forgotten. I think, uh, it's also, okay. I think it's also for me, is I, spent a, I spend a lot of time at the beginning of a new group beginning to understand even though it's written in English translating a lot of the terms and the references because maybe they're new to them and maybe they're unique just to European youth work and youth exchanges yeah when we talk about learning mobility what does that mean for a young person when we talk about um, uh, cultural exchange <laughs> what does that mean for young people so sometimes you have to start really unpacking some of the terms that we take for granted in our processes as well all right. I would also like to ask you uh, for a question about this group process, uh, where is a, a white uh, stretched line. Yeah. Uh, what, what does it mean, group process, in the context of youth exchanges? Yeah. There's some. The regular thing is like the forming the group, and storming, norming, and then performing, and sometimes people see them as a, a greasy pole that goes up and down and maybe the group travels upon that or some people see them as a circle as a circular element or um, some people see them as a line a continuous line that then comes back to the beginning and the, the forming is when the group comes together this is the group they've got the ideas they've got their excitement and they're really interested in that process and then they really start what's called a storming the ideas maybe there's a little bit of conflict a little bit of tension but that's when the group's being creative, they're coming up with their ideas, they're sharing their concepts, their feelings, uh, they're maybe arguing, animated about where they want to go, what type of group they want to find for the part partnership. And then also looking at, um, that becomes level then, becomes a, a lot calmer see. And then they're clear about what they want to do as a group, they're a bit more, and then this, this is called the norming stage. And then maybe that starts again, once they find the partners yeah so once they've identified new partners they're starting to get to know them so that's all the forming process there again and then again the storming and norming uh, process would happen some maybe a little bit of conflict maybe on the zoom the first zoom meeting you're managing a little too many questions or somebody who occupies the space and time a little bit more than others or somebody who's not contributing to the process so you're dealing with all that then you would come to an area after the storming and the norming that the sees calmer again, then you come to the performing stage, which really is about the group being quite tight, really focused on the maybe this is why it's performing there is because it's all about the application form, 
they're really focused, they know they've got a deadline, they know what needs to be done, and they're working towards that deadline. And that whole process will start again. <laughs> um, the regrouping and the new group when they actually come together and start working towards planning and realizing and being there together on the youth exchange. And hopefully, for sharing the final report, they are performing again and <laughs> responding and answering the questions that's required for the final report. It's a youth worker's dream. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I could see you, I could see you smiling, Lana. So it's just like, a, yeah. This is, of course, this is an ideal template. <laughs> Yes, and uh, someone in the chat was already asking, uh, is it possible to get access uh, to the link? Yes, we would upload the recording of this webinar to MOOC platform where we host the course, and we will include the link uh, uh, to this uh, uh, template. Again, uh, you should use it uh, wisely and uh, reshuffle according uh, your group needs and processes. There was also uh, one question from Steph uh, asking which tools and platforms do you use to identify and reach young people who are motivated to engage in the bureaucracy? Huge work uh, on application. Uh, so what kind of tools and, and, and platforms maybe could be helpful in this process? For finding, for finding partners for projects, myself, I, most of the time I encourage people to actually physically attend partner finding, partner building activities contact making seminars because uh, I think the best way the challenge is sometimes that youth workers are going on these attend representing young people so we're making sure that you're going representing the young people's interests young people's voice uh, so that would be one place there of course there's groups online uh, through there's a Facebook group as well uh, for finding partners and posting your uh, your Canva poster saying we're looking for partners anybody interested you really need to build relationships with partners that you can trust as well. And that's uh, even if, um, so it's building relationships between the organizations, um, even if it's not necessarily the youth groups. Okay. And also Limonas is adding that uh, in the process of involving young people, you maybe start from a pen and paper and post-its and more colorful uh, means of expression. And then you transform everything into a more digital collaborative uh, documents. Uh, this kind of example, what we used, Miro, uh, it's a, a one of the tools where you can visualize ideas and you can collaborate uh, also remotely, which might be also very important nowadays, but also throughout the exchange process, if you want to involve different partner groups across uh, distance, maybe you need to use more uh, collaborative tools online to make sure that contributions of young people are included and respected and taken into consideration. Thank you very much, Buz, for this uh, uh, contribution. I hope and it was useful for everybody. Thank you. Yes. And now I would like to turn to Audrey. Uh, and before doing that, I would like to mention that uh, when creating the MOOC uh, content for uh, Youth Exchange module, we used a lot the material provided by Largas National Agency of Erasmus Plus in Ireland on a practical guide for youth exchange. It was very helpful the material and useful for uh, us to convert it into videos, animated videos. So that was very appreciated contribution. And please, Audrey, you're more well welcome to share your screen and start telling good practices from real projects of youth exchanges. Great, yeah. Um, give me one moment. Um, doo -doo. Okay. Mm. You should have, yeah, you can see it. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Audrey and I'm the Youth Exchange Project Officer in Lurgus, as I was I said earlier. Um, and I'm just going to share with you a couple of projects that I don't think, like, I didn't pick projects that I thought were, like, amazing, using really creative ideas, but they were, you know, just really good practical projects um, in their approach of a timeline. Um, so the first project that I picked was uh, the International Rowing and Cultural Exchange Programme. So this is a youth exchange project between Carlow Regional Youth Service and Brixton Wings. Um, so Carlow is a, a, it's based in a rural uh, community in Ireland and they're actually right by a river that a lot of um, rowing. So if you don't know what rowing is, there's a couple of pictures there on the side. Um, so they they, they would be very involved in that kind of activity. 
Brixton Wings is very similar as well. They um, engage uh, young people in a lower socioeconomic community that has a lot of uh, antisocial issues through kind of outdoor activities and uh, one of them being rowing. So the overall project idea was to develop these young people's uh, personal and social skills, increase their confidence and resilience. So the young people that they were involving were uh, what we would call hard to reach young people. So, um, you know, particularly maybe facing a lot of obstacles um, and then maybe at risk of kind of uh, leaving school early or risky kind of behaviours and things like that. So they wanted to kind of uh, engage young people in activities that would promote their social inclusion and reduce the risk of antisocial behavior and provide opportunities not only to develop their soft skills but physical skills of rowing as well. Um, so this is kind of the overview of their timeline that they, of, of their project. So they had a um, clear preparation timeline for a start. So they, they they had a four month lead in time. So they had a meeting with young people and parents in both countries and they explained to them what the, you know, kind of the objective overall of the project. They um, told them about the other organization, what like what their involvement was and how they operate and things like that. So that they could, the young people could kind of think about it and then they could apply if they wanted to uh, participate. Then once the group, once the young people had, so I, I will just say as well, they did have a clear target before they even had that meeting. So the, they had worked with the young people already. It was more like, okay, this is the project. Do you want to join in? Um, and the, um, the, in that four month lead in time, they started to have weekly meetings. So they met every week as a group, which really served a purpose for team building, group work, establishing relationships with the youth worker, as I said, this group of young people um, were hard, hard to reach young people, young people at risk, young people with fewer opportunities. So having a relationship with these young people is really important for the success of the project, for their you know, participation in it, and also for you know, if there's an issue that they're comfortable with the youth worker that they're traveling with. So this is a really important part, I think, of the overall process. Um, and then they had their first youth exchange, um, which went really well. They had it in Ireland. And then once that was finished, um, they still continued to meet as a group. So they maintained their group between the two youth exchanges. And this allowed them to continue to evaluate and reflect on the first exchange and then also plan for the second exchange. Um, and then they had their second exchange. Uh, they did actually have some um, issues uh, the, there was a, a robbery uh, of some money, not within the group, but uh, just in general. But, you know, so it wasn't a perfect, not everything went swimmingly, but they um, had a good relationship with the youth workers. So they, you know, they were able to manage the problem um, quite well. And then afterwards, they had their post evaluation about a month or so after the actual end of the first exchange, they had a post evaluation and they, they've had that continued support and reflection and evaluation and um, now the group has been this only been the they had their post evaluation last october so the group haven't really had like there is plans uh to plan a new youth exchange but as they have been affected by COVID 19 and they can't meet uh face to face as a group they haven't made those plans but they have been meeting um online and things like that as well so then the second project that I just wanted to highlight has a very similar approach, um, but I uh, think Aud even... uh, Audrey, uh, yep. there, will, there was a question. Did you organize those two youth exchanges with the same partners? Um, so the first youth exchange was organized by Car Carlo Regional Youth Service um, and then Brixton Wings was their partner. Yeah, so I think um, just to clarify that Audrey works at the national agency. Yeah, so implementing these projects, but more uh, showing as an example. Yeah, organized by others. So these are projects that we approved um, as a national agency. Um, you know, we would have uh, supported the organizations through the process. And then, so the second um, project I wanted to bring your attention to uh, involved uh, two organizations. One is called Involve, and then the other one is Association Arte No Tempo. And uh, so it was an Irish organization called Involve, and then Arte No Tempo is a Portuguese organization. The 
main objective was to build uh, leadership skills, but also to explore um, the issues that these young people faced as they both were identified as young people with fewer opportunities. So it brought together, so the young people from Ireland are from the traveling community, which is a minority group in Ireland and involve primarily work with this group. This is, these are a young, group of young people that are established within the organization that they have regular contact with. And then the young people from Portugal were young people at risk of uh, early school leaving. Um, and the overall aims were to, you know, promote social inclusion, develop their skills and uh, enhance their European citizenship and identity and celebrate their youth because as particularly with the Irish group, they don't, uh, they face a lot of barriers. They um, are, would receive a lot of discrimination um, and face a lot of challenges. So to celebrate their youth was a big part of the project um, as well. So again, this is the timeline. Uh, this project had an even longer lead in time. So they had six months of workshops that they had. And through those six months, they began to select participants that would be involved in the youth exchange. Then the young people were involved in selecting the partners, the country that they wanted to travel to, the topic of the project. They, they uh, were involved in the kind of activities that they wanted to do as well. Um, and then before they could even really uh, go any further, they actually had to get the parents on the side of the project. So um, they had home visits with parents and meeting with, meetings with parents. Um, because the group in Ireland would come from very um, conservative, like their families would be very strict um, and you would really need to build a lot of trust with the families so that they would uh, allow their, their children to participate in a project like, like this. So this was a really strong element of this project was that groundwork that they did with uh, not just the young people but also with the, the community and the parents. Um, and then they also did pre-evaluations with the young people, like mapping out their expectations and everything. Uh, they, by the time the first youth exchange happened, they had a really strong relationship with the group. I mean, they were already familiar with the young people, but they, they met regularly as a group to establish that uh, relationship. And then, you know, they continued to have regular meetings between the two youth exchange to manage the group and also provide opportunity to evaluate and support in between those two exchanges. Again, they had their post evaluation and continued support and reflection and the group is still working with the organization. The organization are planning more exchanges with them. And um, so it hasn't just like dropped off after the, the exchange has happened. So the reasons why I think these projects demonstrate best practice or good practice is that they had an, a clear identified target group and the phases of the project were adapted to their needs. So the meetings with parents and things like that, the establishing of, of those relationships were crucial for this particular target group. And um, then on top of that, they had a really clear timeline. They told us when they were going to meet, how often they were going to meet, what kind of activities they were going to be involved in. Um, then again, the relationship building and group dynamics was a, a key component of the overall plan. They had strong communication, not only with the participants, but with the guardians um, and parents. There was consistent support throughout the project. And then there was engagement with the young from the young people throughout the project life cycle. So there was activities that were happening outside of the mobility. So they were having group meetings, you know, before and after in between the different exchanges. And then I'm just going to quickly highlight, uh, so in Lurgus we've just um, developed a document that highlights best practice uh, in terms of safeguarding uh, in, mob in mobilities. Um, and I think the document, it takes the different phases of a project and kind of highlights uh, kind of key points in them. And I just selected the, uh, one of the earlier stages, which is the selection and inclusion of participants which I think it, it really highlights, it, highlights it really clearly the different things that you might do. So invest time, clearly explain what the project is, use an application process that's easy to follow, um, consider whether the project is connected to other aspects of their lives, support them with any fears and anxieties, connect them with someone they trust, inform them of some of the risks that before they sign up, 
give them responsibilities, inform them of the work that's involved, have an open and honest selection process, and mind the young people that are in selected, and then involve parents in the process. And then the follow-up phase as well, um, again, it's investing that time into the debriefing process. You know, these experiences can be life changing for young people. The young people that I mentioned before uh, from involved the uh, young travelers would have never left, the, some of them would have never left the country before. They wouldn't have had passports, their parents wouldn't have left the country before. So it's really important uh, to invest time both before and after to ensure that their experience is a positive one. Um, and then, you know, you kind of, you can support them uh, to explore follow-up projects. Um, and then it's good, you know, if there are any concerns that arise um, during the evaluation phase, it's really important to follow up on it and to record that kind of stuff as well. And then, uh, you know, trying to maximize the impact the project has delivered and capture the learning to enhance future projects. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, these, these, these are taken from that document, um, which is really useful and I can share it if, if needed, if anyone is interested. Um, but if there is any uh, questions, that was kind of a very quick run through of a couple of projects that I thought were good examples. Um, Thank you, Audrey, for sharing and picking up examples which uh, had a long-term uh, approach to youth exchanges, so a youth exchange as a process, and especially that uh, you chose projects which included young people, which uh, usually it's harder to reach and keep motivated throughout this long process. And meanwhile, we are still giving a chance for people to ask for questions uh, and uh, uh, on the chats. Uh, I would like to ask you, from these projects, uh, could you name a couple of examples of effective methods, activities, or tools which organizers used with uh, uh, these special target groups? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that they would have done was they would have used a variety of, um, particularly in the evaluation, a variety of different methods. So they would have used walking debates. Um, they also would have used questionnaires as, and surveys and things like that as well, more for their own records so they they use kind of a paper version for their own uh, internal records and um, but then the young people um they supported them by using things like walking debates and world cafes they were the kind of primary things that they did uh for evaluation for the preparation it was very much i think more about the the regular consistent contact contact and um, they would have used a variety of different activities but it was more about and particularly because they're young people with fewer opportunities, it was more about getting that commitment and that um, consistent engagement uh, throughout, if you know what I mean. All right, thank you. There are quite a few people saying thank you for good examples, interesting examples. And we have a couple of questions. Uh, Christian is asking, uh, uh, how was uh, to monitor two uh, follow-up dissemination uh, activities, how to, how to do two follow-up dissemination activities when you have two-leg exchange where a hosting country wants a, a host some group and then they continue the same project being hosted in another country so how how to manage such a stressful uh, yeah project so I think dissemination you know is something that can happen throughout so you know obviously with social media you can be doing these things throughout the exchange so as it's happening you can be um, sharing it online and things like that but then post the, like, so kind of towards the end, I know with Involve, uh, again, they had a, a presentation with local stakeholders um, and parents. So um, they very much involved the, the community um, because that was such a, an important part of it. And they had a presentation that the young people gave and show, shared their experience. And that was at the end of the project. That, and that, that was mirrored then on the other side. So the, while, um, while the, two legs happened one after another, they both, I suppose, shared the experiences following the two exchanges, if you know what I mean, does that answer? All right, thank you. Uh, Thomas is asking, uh, uh, he's asking for some advices on uh, uh, how to engage group leaders into facilitating workshops or activities during youth exchange. Uh, I guess when it, you have a project partners coming together, then you need uh, group leaders to facilitate some workshops or activities. So how, what, what kind of advices you could give to better engage? 
I, I think it's important that this kind of stuff is established at the start of the project. So I think Buzz really um, highlighted the stages um, and, you know, you really need to connect with your partner, know who they are, know their strengths, know your strengths, um, and then agree amongst you which tasks you feel is most appropriate for you to lead and to facilitate. So that should be established well before the exchange actually happens or even, even before the application happens. I think Buzz is agreeing. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I'm agreeing, but also I think uh, if I think tra looking maybe for training opportunities on Salto for the leaders to facilitate creative methods application. You know, there's lots of training courses on there that maybe could help some people on the emerging leadership facilitation of leadership skills and activities and tools and methods as well. Yeah, I would also say that uh, uh, when designing a youth exchange, and especially if you involve young people from beginning, it's also worth looking at what young people can run as a workshop or activity. Very often they have clear ideas what they want to do with other young people, and then the role of group leaders uh, is actually to support them on this journey. So preparing well before exchange, and then the groups meet, they do their way uh, of delivering activities and workshops. I think that's the one of the highest level of the involvement of young people. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, and there's also some advice from Dragon saying that uh, a plan of orientation and training for them also could be. So if your partners, let's say, are new to youth exchange, maybe it's worth uh, uh, having a more detailed plan of action in terms of what will happen during exchange, finding specific roles, and also training. Sometimes you need to invest in your partners to uh, keep them on the same level or on board with uh, delivering uh, activities. I think it's important. So again, those projects, one of the things that they were both trying to do was to um, build up their own capacity as well. So at the youth workers themselves were looking to develop their skills too. So you very much do learn from your partners um, along the way. Uh, and I think that's important to consider. So when you're considering your partners, you can take that into account as well. I think it's really important not to become, uh, for the leaders, for the leaders and youth workers and also the young people, that they're just not consumers of a process. They're actually in participants leading in it, engaged in it. And like uh, Audrey says as well, it's a, not just for the young people, it's a fantastic learning opportunity for the leaders and the youth workers supporting the project in the first place. All right. Thank you both, Booz and Audrey, for being with us and contributing with good practices, sharing uh, practical tips and advices on how a youth exchange can really become more than just a holiday. Uh, it should become a learning experience for all. Uh, now I would like to uh, use the remaining time to share a bit what you can uh, continue learning on our course. So I will share the screen and explain a little bit what kind of uh, uh, material and resources you can find if you join our course online and my colleague Limelos will share links with you uh, how to access the course. Again, the course is available to join anytime this year. Uh, it is running uh, throughout uh, all the months, summertime and uh, autumn, so you can join and find different resources. Specifically for youth exchanges, we have a module consisted of several sessions. The session would include uh, uh, some visual and uh, the text material uh, for finding about, uh, uh, let's say, rules of youth exchanges and requirements. Uh, it will have quizzes to check your knowledge. Uh, it will have uh, uh, videos uh, explaining specific uh, aspects of organizing a youth exchange with uh, also a webinar recording from uh, uh, the first uh, uh, round uh, where we focused on uh, especially supporting young people's involvement in uh, the entire youth exchange project. So there are quite some uh, materials available with links, uh, additional information, uh, how to find, uh, uh, for example, partners. We offer partner search uh, space for people who want. So we invite you to enroll to the course and use available opportunities to learn about youth exchanges. Besides youth exchanges, we have also other modules uh, focusing on other opportunities of Erasmus+, Plus. let's say uh, mobility of youth workers. So if you want to organize a staff training, someone was asking how to uh, engage and uh, motivate uh, group leaders from your partner organizations to 
uh, lead the workshops. Maybe you need to start from organizing a training activity together to learn best, uh, most effective methodologies of running a workshop during a youth exchange. So for that, you have youth workers mobility. And uh, what I would like to also advertise a bit is opportunity to uh, meet us again in a webinar uh, on uh, 9th of July, uh, 3 o'clock Central European Summer Time, uh, where we will be focusing on differences between youth exchanges and mobility of youth workers. What we notice from uh, 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 European cooperation field, if you're new to the program, it's not so easy to understand what's the difference between youth exchange, a project led by young people supported by adults, and a project which is targeting uh, youth workers and youth leaders to develop their competences. So sometimes we find it mixed up uh, together in terms of objectives, methodologies, the way they are presented for applications. So on 9th of July, three o'clock, Central European uh, summertime, you will be invited to uh, join this webinar. Keep uh, following uh, uh, our MOOC Youth uh, Facebook page. And if you want to join MOOC Youth uh, group, you can find them on Facebook and join. And then we will be informed about upcoming opportunities to learn more about quality in Erasmus Plus and funding opportunities. So uh, that's all from us. Before leaving, uh, you from this webinar i would like to ask for a poll from lime on us who would like to check the audience who is already enrolled in a mooc course 